I apologize if you've come to the three other talks I've given. There's new, some new material in here, but you'll have heard some of my jokes and some of my story. But uh, if you've come to all three of my talks and you're at the fourth, maybe you probably should leave anyways. <laughs> um, might have a stalker, and my wife is here, so she, she is a little feisty too. So. Uh, no, it's a pleasure to kind of wrap up things and, and kind of summarize some of, of what I've, some thoughts and concepts that I've uh, kind of shared with uh, in some of the other talks. But I want to talk about how can we improve the health of these cats through nutrition. And, and I always say this is fairly intuitive to think about nutrition improving the health of calves because calves deal with a lot of enteric or gastrointestinal disease. And when you feed an animal, you're supplying things directly to where the problem is. So. Um, a lot of what I'll talk about is, is related to gastrointestinal disease, and at the end, I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about how nutrition, and this is an area that we're spending more time in in my lab now, how nutrition early in life during the pre-weaning phase is setting the stage to help improve the, the post-weaning health of these animals, mostly dealing with respiratory diseases is what we've been focused on. <clears throat> so again, talk about gastrointestinal disease and then jump into to different nutritional strategies to do that, and, and the primary mechanisms by which nutrition can, can improve the health or gastrointestinal health is preventing a potential pathogen, whether or not it's a virus or a bacteria or a protozoa, from actually attaching and interacting with the intestinal cells of the, the calf. So nutrition can actually reduce the interaction of the pathogen with the calf, and we'll go through some different strategies uh, that way. Um, I spent yesterday talking about plain and nutrition, did, a, did an entire lecture on that. I will just summarize some of, of the, how much milk solids um, should we be feeding calves and, and what are the impacts on both gastrointestinal disease and, and risk for respiratory disease later in life. And then we'll talk about early life nutrition and, and influence on, on health later in life. So <clears throat> uh, risk of mortality greatly reduces after <clears throat> two to three weeks of life, right? I told the story yesterday about when my two little children were born. I have pictures of them at the end of my slide because I'm ready to go home and see them. We've been gone for a week. Um, but when my daughter was born, <clears throat> one, she didn't drink colostrum right away, and I, that really stressed me out. And I told my wife, we need to make sure that we get colostrum. Um, and I just kept kind of <laughs> monitoring, and, and that stressed her out. Um, <clears throat> but the other thing is people would come visit. Like we weren't even, we had a, she had a C-section, and we weren't even out of the, the thing, and people were already trying to come in. And I said, I told my wife, I was like, if we can just let everybody leave, and if we can get her past two to three weeks of life, then I'll have a little party and we'll have everybody come over and then they can see the baby. Because they always put their, their face in, in my baby's mouth and I'm, just, I'm always nervous about calves. And I'm always nervous about little babies too for the first couple weeks of life. My wife will tell me that I don't interact with the children for the first couple weeks of life. It's because I've killed a lot of calves in the first couple weeks of life. <laughs> I killed fewer calves after two to three weeks of life. Um, so the question is, is what has really changed in this calf that you've really greatly reduced the risk of disease. I, I, we do quite a bit of disease challenge in my lab, and I have some very specific like salmonella that I work with. And I know if I give this amount of salmonella, I should see this type of disease response. And if I give a dose of, let's just say, 10, billion or 10 million of this salmonella at seven days of age, I'm gonna get a lot of sick calves. If I give 10 million at three weeks of life, I get fewer sick calves. Something's changed in this calf, okay? So the, the gastrointestinal immune system of these calves have changed, so the question is what's actually changed that they're less likely to get sick, okay? Um, <clears throat> so we'll, we'll walk through some of that and, and go through it relatively quickly. Some components of the gastrointestinal immune system only will develop once the calf's in the environment. So that, that, that's just a, a reality that we're gonna deal with, is a lot has actually occurred while she's in utero, but some aspects won't develop until she's, she's out of the, the, the or the calf's in the environment. What's interesting is if you take mice and you do a C-section on them and grow them in a sterile environment, parts of their gastrointestinal immune system won't develop, okay? Other parts still will, so it, it um, but part of the, the actual development of the gastrointestinal immune system is just being exposed to, to the environment. Um, calf's in a bit of a catch-22 situation because we know that she needs to absorb, I keep saying she, so we'll just deal with heifer calves, forget the bull calves for now. Um, she needs to absorb immunoglobulin. Immunoglobulin is a, a large molecule. If I feed you a diet of immunoglobulin, you're gonna digest it and absorb the amino acids in, okay? Our gastrointestinal tracts digest things, okay? This gastrointestinal tract does not digest very well, okay? It's gonna keep this immunoglobulin in, intact 
and then that large molecule actually gets absorbed into the bloodstream, okay, across the intestines and into the, into the body. That's not normal, okay? Um, but we, we need that, okay? So she gets passive absorption of macromolecules, but this also increases the risk that she's going to absorb other things like an E. coli or salmonella or something else, okay? And that's not a good thing, right? Everybody agrees, absorbing E. coli and salmonella into the bloodstream, allowing it to get around the body, get into the liver, kidneys, wherever, that's not good, right? So that's the catch-22 situation. We need it to be absorbed. What, um, you've probably heard me start, if you've heard me talk, you've heard me talk about cleanliness of colostrum, and I'll go into it. There's a lot of dirty colostrum. I would say the majority of colostrum is pretty dirty, lots of bacteria, okay? And so when, even when we're feeding colostrum that's just good, we can have a situation where we're, we're actually exposing them to a lot of microorganisms, increasing the risk for disease. Ideal situation, okay, sometimes I just like to pretend like I live in an ideal world, there's no problems. Um, I don't like watching the news if you <laughs> didn't catch that. Um, absorb adequate antibodies, no absorption of microorganisms, and then have that uh, gastrointestinal tract start maturing really rapidly, okay? The quicker we can get that uh, gastrointestinal tract to mature, the less likely she's gonna be susceptible to gastrointestinal disease, okay? That, that's why she becomes less likely to get sick is because we've had the, the gastrointestinal tract uh, immune system develop. There's lots of different components to the immune system, lots of different layers. Um, and so I always look at the immune system like it's a home security system, okay? I'm not gonna go into a lot of details on the immune system today, but just think about designing an ideal way to protect your house, okay? And you live in a really dangerous neighborhood and you wanna have every type of protection you can. Build a huge fence around it so people can't even get close to your house. Put a bunch of real mean dogs in the, inside the fence line so if something gets over the fence or through the fence, they're not gonna wanna stay there or even be able to get close to your house. Okay, those are like antimicrobial secretions or immunological barrier, those are like the dogs. Um, and then we have this microbial barrier in the, the gastrointestinal tract which is, which is kinda interesting, we'll go into a little bit more detail on that but we have trillions of bacteria that live in our bodies. The calves have trillions of, of bacteria that live in their body and most of them are not posing any threat and actually conferring some benefit to the calf as well. And we see this microbial barrier change. What I'm gonna quickly go through is, is these four different layers of the immune system and show you that there's holes, I already told you my conclusion, there's holes in every aspect of the immune system. I wish there was just one thing said, well, here's the problem is, we do not have enough panic cells that produce enough defensins. That was the only problem. Then we can maybe identify a single strategy to, to increase beta defensin uh, secretion, but what you're gonna see is there's lots of little holes and in, in probably cumulatively, that's what's increasing the risk for disease. So the physical barriers are these intestinal cells. We constantly expose, you probably didn't realize you ate bacteria for lunch, right? I guarantee you ate some bacteria, some viruses, protozoa. I, you, we live in a microbial world, okay? Madonna said we live in a, in a material world. She's partly right, we do, but we live in a microbial world too, so we're constantly exposing ourselves. It's one of the, the primary ways that we expose ourselves to, to the environment is through food, okay? And so our gastrointestinal immune cells, these enterocytes, are at the interface between what was consumed in, in our body, and they need to form a, a physical barrier and protect, okay? And the, the intestinal immune system is also sensing what's out there. And, the, and they're, they're responding and changing how the immune system responds by sensing what's out there in the, in the environment. But it's really important to prevent anything that was consumed in the diet from getting into the body. And these enterocytes are really important in doing that. Unfortunately, these vacuolated enterocytes are a little bit non-selective and, and will absorb um, some things that, that they shouldn't be absorbing. Gut closure, these, these vacuolated enterocytes or neonatal enterocytes change quite rapidly in the matter of hours to, to days. Um, it occurs from a proximal to distal pattern, so it starts up in the duodenum and moves down the intestines to the ileum. It starts in the crypts and moves to the villi tips. So even though quantitatively gut closure occurs quite rapidly, I think the gut is still somewhat unclosed or, or somewhat leaky per se for longer than we, we typically think it is. It's probably close to quantitatively a large amount of IgG absorption, but I think that, that gut is still open to other things, like maybe some microorganisms or, or things like that, for a longer period of time than 24 or 48 hours. 
uh, we have reduced tight junctions. So tight junctions between, here's one enterocyte, here's another enterocyte. We have these proteins that hold these cells together so we can't get anything between them. Okay, that's a, that's a good, it's like red, did they play Red Rover here when you were little kids in Red Rover, Red Rover? Okay, no. I'm not gonna <laughs> try to explain if you didn't get it. Um, you, when you're little kids on a playground, you hold hands and then the goal is there's two lines and you run across and try to break through the, the hands of two people. And if you break through, you win. If you didn't break through, you get added to that line. Um, I did explain it. Um, it's two things held together. Uh, these tight junctions hold these cells together and it doesn't allow anything to go through, like a bacteria, for example. Reduced tight junctions in, in other neonates, this data isn't in calves, but the, there's a reduced tight junctions and they start increasing their expression as this calf uh, gets a little, or as these animals get a little bit older. Another uh, part of the physical barrier of the immune system are these goblet cells. Goblet cells live in the intestines, they're these little white cells right here. They produce mu mucin, okay, they, they, that contributes to the mucus layer that sits above the intestines. That mucus layer is an extremely important physical barrier. It also concentrates lots of antimicrobial factors in there that, that make it a not a very hospitable environment to most pathogens. Um, but these goblet cells, what's in, interesting is they only really start secreting after they've been exposed to microbes from the environment, okay? Or, or there's microbial exposure. So at birth, there's not a lot of goblet cells secreting mucin. They only start really producing that after the, the calf's been born. So that's just gonna take a little bit of time for that, that uh, mucin, that mucus layer or barrier to, to form. Uh, the chemical immunological, there's these immune cells called panath cells. They live down here at the bottom of the, the crypt. And these panath cells, what they do is they produce natural antibiotics, antimicrobials, we'll call it. Um, most of them are small peptides. Uh, and, and what they do is, is they basically are antimicrobial. And we know from other species that these secretions increase postnatal. And it doesn't appear to be related to microbial exposure, like I just mentioned for the mucin. It, it seems to be more driven or uh, ingrained that it just increases as a calf gets uh, older. Secretory IgA, so most of you probably know that there's immunoglobulin secreted into the intestines. Um, it's, it's not primarily IgG like we see in milk, it's something called IgA. IgA we mostly find on like the gastrointestinal mucosal surfaces or the respiratory um, or the urogenital surface. The secretory IgA looks like this, but it essentially does the same thing. Um, and what you're gonna see is in a calf, secretory IgA levels are really low at birth, and then they start increasing as this calf gets exposed to things. Okay, I've said this, I think, in every talk I've given. One, one of the reasons why calves get sick is they're just young. They're babies. Babies get sick, right? Why do babies get sick? Because they haven't been exposed to, to many things. Our immune system learns and, and, and hopefully gets better, okay? Just like we learn and become better people, okay? <laughs> Um, I always say that I, I hopefully make better decisions than now than when I was 18, okay? Most of the time. Um, and, and part of it is just our immune system's learning, and this is the part of the immune system that's learning is this, this IgA. Um, recirculation of colostrum antibodies, about half the, the antibodies that were absorbed from colostrum had been recirculated back to the gastrointestinal tract and, and have left uh, through fecal excretion. So about half the colostrum antibodies are gone within two weeks. So that's not explaining why they're less likely to get sick after two weeks. And then lastly, the microbial barrier. I put a trillion, I used to put plus or minus something, but it, there, there's just a lot, okay? And, and there's not really a good assessment. Here's what I always tell people, and this is still true even though they backed off how many microbes live in, in uh, <coughs> mammals, is that there's more microbes living in a mammal's body than cells that they have of their, their own cells. Okay, I always say there's a crap load of microbes that live in you, literally, okay? Most of them live in your large intestines and the lower part of your small intestines, but you've got a lot of microorganisms. Most of them are not a threat <clears throat> to the calf. In adults, greater than 99% are gonna be strict anaerobic bacteria like bifidobacteria or lactobacilli or the, the, the two most common genuses of uh, bacteria that you'll see there. And in almost every neonate, you'll see there's a progression from facultative anaerobes from the environment to these more strict anaerobes that you see in an adult. So almost every neonate, when they're young, you're gonna see a lot of enterobacter. And enterobacter are like E. coli, salmonella, klebsiella, uh, streptococcus, and staphylococcus. So again, you see a lot of these in the environment. And if you go in and look at the intestinal tract of a, of a young calf, you'll see a lot of these, okay? If you go in and look at an intestinal tract of uh, 
uh, uh, 60 day old calf or 90 day old calf, you're going to see a lot more of these bifidobacteria and lactobacilli and fewer amounts of these streptococcus and enterobacter. Okay, so there's just this natural progression. Raised calves in a dirtier environment, this progression is delayed. Okay, so raised calves in a more dirty environment, this, this should, be, should be delayed. This is fecal anaerobic bacteria just cultured. This is calf age 7, 21, 42. This is just one of my grad students. Just show we saw about a log fold increase and the total fecal anaerobic bacteria that we could culture. Um, not the best way to do it. You can't culture most of the, the things in feces, but this is just showing we are seeing that typical progression to more strict anaerobic bacteria. And if, if you looked at total uh, enterobacter, it basically went down a log fold. So again, we're seeing that, sh that shift. <clears throat> so why do many calves get sick and die in the first couple weeks of life? Well, there's a lot of holes, literally holes, in the GI immune system for the first few weeks of life, okay? From the physical barriers to the chemical immunological barriers to the microbial barriers, there's lots of changes in development that, that's taking place. The good news is, is I think there's nutritional strategies that can help hasten or prevent at least the, the interaction of potential pathogens with the host while this takes place, okay? Because this is just going to take a little bit of time, okay? We hate things that take time, right? But, it, but the fact is, is it takes a little bit of time. So what role can nutrition play in reducing enteric disease? What's the most important thing we can do on a farm to reduce gastrointestinal disease? It's a calf talk. Colostrum, yeah. So colostrum. What's the goal of colostrum management? If you said you had a successful colostrum program, what are you telling? If, I, if you tell me you have a successful colostrum management program, what is that information based off of? You have no problems in your calves? Yeah, that's a good one. That's a better answer than I was going to give. <laughs> <laughs> failure of passive transfer. You're getting absorption of immunoglobulins, correct? That's, you, you don't have failure of passive transfer, or low incidence of failure of passive transfer. Good absorption of immunoglobulins. You're just giving one feed of colostrum. Am I just giving one feed? If you're just giving that one feed of colostrum in the first 24 hours, how quickly are those antibodies washed out? And what impact does that have on GI? So if you're just giving one feeding of, of uh, or one day's worth of, of colostrum feeding, how quickly are those washed out? And what impact does that have on gut protection? I'll come back to that. I'm going to go through a little bit on, on colostrum. Um, so most people would say passive transfer of, of antibodies is what is their goal when they're looking at their colostrum management program. I have not ever heard anybody say maturation of the gastrointestinal immune system is my goal when I feed colostrum, right? People don't feed colostrum for maturation of the gastrointestinal tract. I've never heard anybody say that. Has anybody ever heard anybody say that? Okay. Um, I'm the only one that's probably said it. Um, so there's more to colostrum than just antibodies. Um, there's lots of different compounds. There's, there's cytokines, pro-inflammatory cytokines. There's, there's proteins that are produced from immune cells. Um, there's lots of growth hormones. IGF-1 is, is really one of the most predominant hormones found in, in colostrum. So there's lots of other things in colostrum. And if you look at probably what those things do, they're probably involved in the postnatal development of the gastrointestinal immune system. So part of getting to your point of just one feeding of colostrum, you're going to get the absorption of hemoglobins that, that you probably need for systemic protection and, and some enteric protection, but you may be missing the boat on postnatal development of the gastrointestinal because we know it's going to take some time. There's compounds in colostrum that help that occur, okay? Um, so you may be missing the boat a little bit. So improved calf health if colostrum management was also focused on improving GI immune system. It gets a little bit more complicated because I already told you colostrum's dirty, right? If colostrum wasn't dirty, it, it may be a little bit easier. So here's some data on colostrum cleanliness. Uh, in terms of colony forming units per mil, this is how many bacterial colonies you can grow. It ranged from 3,000 per milliliter to almost 7 million per milliliter. There's been a threshold defined of, of 100,000. Anything less than 100,000 would be okay, okay? And in a study from the U.S., 43% was 43% of samples were greater than that 100,000, and 17% were greater than 1 million. Okay, this stuff's pretty. You got a lot of microbes in there. Okay, potentially could cause a, a lot of uh, issues if fed to a calf. Okay, I've, I've joked uh, 
uh, with people, it's probably better to actually just throw this on the ground than actually uh, feed the calf and just pretend like you fed the calf colostrum. I don't know. Um, should I pasteurize colostrum? Depends. I tell some people yes. You know why? Because I look at their colostrum and it's really dirty. It's probably better to pasteurize colostrum. Pasteurizing colostrum may have some impacts on GI maturation because you may be denaturing some of those proteins that were bioactive, so they're no longer active. But the bigger issue in this case is that they just have really dirty colostrum, and they're not going to do the things to manage that. It's easier for them just to pasteurize it. So again, it's, if you've heard me, I said I manage risk, and I'm looking at these things from a systematic standpoint. What's the lesser of two evils? Yes, I would like to feed colostrum for gastrointestinal maturation, but I've also been told, get the colostrum in it because it's dirty, get the IgGs absorbed, and move on. So I, I think there's truth to both. It just, again, depends on, on the management system that you're working with and, and who you're working with. Um, are there any additives we can add to colostrum to improve? This isn't really well known, um, and, and we got into a little bit of a discussion in one of the talks is it may actually be negative to add certain things to colostrum where they may be antagonist to other things. So, and that is a valid point. But the fact is, is there just hasn't been a lot done with just adding things to, to colostrum. Um, so again, one of the main strategies while this gastrointestinal tract is, is a, not evolving but developing is can we feed some things that are gonna prevent the interaction pathogens with the calves, okay? So prebiotics, not easily, easily digested carbohydrates, also have been shown to improve bacterial growth like the, some of those strict anaerobic, anaerobic bacteria. So typically data where they feed a pro, prebiotic, you may see shifts towards more anaerobic bacteria in the, the gut, which is a good thing. Um, there's also uh, some potential binding of gram-negative bacteria. Not all prebiotics bind gram-negative bacteria. It's mostly the man and oligosaccharide, and I'll show you that. So moss products do have a pretty good uh, record of, of showing that they can bind gram-negative bacteria, but not all prebiotics uh, will bind gram-negative bacteria. Probiotics are typically those strict anaerobic bacteria, and if you look at most probiotic uh, genuses, it's going to be the lactobacilli or enterococcus um, bacteria, and some bacillus also get in there. Um, but it's going to be some of these strict anaerobic bacteria. Remember, there's a progression to these things. So it actually, from a teleological standpoint, makes sense maybe to, to feed probiotics to, to young neonates because you're just helping that, that natural progression to the, these strict anaerobic bacteria. And then there's various functional proteins we can feed too, from colostrum, feeding purified IgG. A couple grams of purified IgG is not going to hurt anybody, right? It's going to act locally probably in the gut. Um, immunized egg, I've started doing a little bit more with this. This, this had uh, come about in, the, I think, the late 90s or sometime in the 90s. Had kind of gotten criticized a little bit, and I've started seeing it come back a little bit. And we've done some stuff, and, and to be honest with you, I think if done correctly, there, there's some benefit there. Um, and then also plasma proteins um, have, have been used. Here's a, uh, a study that we just wrapped, uh, a preliminary study that we just wrapped up. Uh, looking at the binding capabilities of some various uh, products, looking at the gram-negative binding capability. And, and we used an E. coli and salmonella that we use in disease challenges in calves. And I tested a couple different things. This was my negative control. This is bovine serum albumin. So this shouldn't bind anything, okay? But it's, it's just the protein um, that shouldn't bind anything. And then I included two products here that are commercial products that have been suggested or shown to bind uh, either E. coli and or salmonella. And so product one and product two. Beta-glucan, I have also always said that beta-glucans aren't very good at binding. And so I wanted to kind of prove it to myself that it, it doesn't bind. So we included a, this was a yeast-derived beta-glucan in this case. And then two yeast cell wall extracts uh, that, that we uh, extracted in the lab. And so yeast cell wall extract one from my lab, and then we did a further extraction uh, that's a more soluble uh, fraction, um, yeast cell wall two extract. And basically what, what we looked at is how many E. coli could this bind, and, and how many salmonella could this bind? So if you look at this relative to the negative control, both product one and product two did bind, and actually bound exactly the same in, in the, the average of these triplicates. Um, and then we were actually able to get better uh, gram-negative binding. This is basically just showing that obviously not all yeast cell wall products are the same. So these are technically four yeast cell wall, different yeast cell wall products, and you can see we were able to actually get a lot better binding with this yeast cell wall extract uh, from my lab. And you see the same thing with salmonella. It basically kind of follows the, the same thing. 
they are binding salmonella, both these pro commercial products, but we were able to do further extractions and, and actually get better isolation. Probably has to do with more purified moss and, and also maybe the structure, the three-dimensional structure of, of the moss is what we were going for. So again, this is just showing that, that there are some strategies where we can actually bind to, to salmonella and or E. coli. I got the question yesterday, are these binding in a concentration that actually is relevant in vivo? Because this is done in my lab in a, in a Petri dish or in a 96 well uh, plate. Um, and I said, that's actually a really good question, answer or question. And I said, we're actually moving in and doing some ileal loops with the a potential path with these, this E. coli and salmonella in an intestinal loop system in a calf with and without the, the, the different extracts. And, and so we'll be able to, to look at that. Um, the concentration we were using was all the same concentration, and it would equate to about a one gram feed rate. So um, whether or not they're stopping up enough of the E. coli and salmonella to prevent um, actual um, disease or, or some pathology is yet to be determined. Looking at uh, some of the, the probiotic Putative mechanisms of action. Competitive inhibition is one of the main ones. Is if you put a bunch of bacteria that really aren't that dangerous, and they have to, to compete against maybe some ones that are dangerous, that you get some benefit. Okay, I said it yesterday. I, I used to say this quite a bit, and I don't say it as much anymore. The analogy I used to say is: Are you more likely to get robbed in church, surrounding yourself with lots of good people, right, or on the south side of town? south side of Chicago, and so the guy came up to me afterwards, he's like, you're more likely to get robbed in church. They're all thieves and stuff. So I was like, all right, all right. <laughs> this guy got burned along the way some way. Point is, is I will tell you, when my daughter and, and son start having friends, I'm going to hopefully help them surround themselves with good people, right? And, and because if things come against you, it will help. Okay, so again, that's some of the, the one of the main philosophies is just competitive inhibition for spaces and resources. Some of these probiotic bacteria produce, I mean, a lot of them produce lactic acid, and, and so keep that intestines low, the, the pH low on the lower part of the intestines. Um, and they also produce other bacteria sins or antimicrobial factors. And they also may stimulate other mucosal immune defenses, like we said with those goblet cells producing mucin and uh, mucus, uh, for example, uh, it may stimulate that, or they may stimulate some of the the beta defense in, or the defense in secretions from the pan itself. So, um, or they may be doing something related to the, the, there's been a lot of data on the human side and rodent side that they alter other aspects of systemic immune system. Here's just a quick little study. Uh, anaerobic lactic acid bacteria, a combination of them, just three Holstein heifers um, supplemented uh, for three days with two billion colony forming units of a combination of lactobacillus casein and Pteracoccus faecium. We started them at seven days of age. We took a fecal sample just before we started, fed them for three days, took a fecal sample, and all I did is just looked at the total colony, colony forming units per gram. Um, and this is just showing in the light gray, the, the pre-supplementation values in terms of colony forming units and then post-supplementation. And these are the, just the three calves and then the average. So again, you can see every calf had a dramatic increase in the number of bacteria that we were able to isolate. So again, by feeding these live cultures, we were able to get them through the gastrointestinal tract. Okay, we've also shown that these things inter interact with the, the mucus layer, the mucin layer of the, the ileum, and actually will colonize there. Uh, it's a transient colonization, but they, they do attach to the, to the ileum as well. So here was a study we did in 2011. We did a combination approach, um, fed some prebiotics, uh, both FOSS and MOSS, um, and then probiotics, and then hyperimmunized egg protein from birth to 21 days of age. Less enteric morbidity, classified as scouring. So 50% of our control calves scoured, 25% of our treated calves scoured. So 50 calves per treatment, or 45 calves per treatment, fed identically, managed identically. The only difference is the 45 of the calves got this blend of products in the milk. The other ones didn't get anything. Another thing we measure a lot, um, especially in high-risk calves, is milk refusal in the first few days of life. It's kind of a measure of vigor. Um, basically, it's voluntary milk refusals. And those calves that were treated uh, refused less milk, basically a third um, less milk than, than the calves that, that weren't uh, treated with anything. Really no differences in any plasma metabolites or average daily gain efficiency. These calves weren't eating much starter. We were feeding a restricted quantity of milk. It's not uh, surprising that there was no difference. And it was only a 21-day period and no difference in starter intake um, in this. 
What's interesting in, in more recent stuff, this, this was a study that was done a few years ago, and more recent stuff where we've been feeding probiotics or various yeast or yeast cell wall products, we start seeing more starter intake really starting to take place around 21 days um, is where they really start separating. So that may be why we didn't see it in this. Um, here was a study that, that we did uh, last, uh, this uh, past spring. Uh, when did, what, what day is it? <laughs> it's June. We did it last spring. It was the, like my son, this is how stupid I am. My son was born and I went in and challenged a bunch of calves with salmonella and told my grad students, I'll see you in a week or whatever when you finish the study. Stupid stuff, okay? Um, uh, that's why I don't interact with my, my kids for the first few weeks of life because usually I'm just nervous that I'm covered in something. Uh, 21, 24 one-day-old Jersey bull calves from a calf ranch, uh, blocked by total serum protein and initial body weight. We enrolled them into three different treatments, so a small, relatively small study, um, eight calves per treatment. Uh, the first treatment was a control group. Um, the second treatment was a control group, basically just fed a non-medicated, um, no-additive milk replacer, 22% uh, crude protein, 20% uh, fat milk replacer. The, the second group was fed the same milk replacer, and challenged with salmonella on day seven. And then uh, the other group was fed uh, the same milk replacer, but we added probiotic to it. And then we challenged them at seven days in milk as well. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, we supplemented the, the probiotic for the first three days at a really high level, 20 billion colony forming units. Um, and then we backed it down for the remainder of the study down to two billion colony forming units. But again, these last two groups on day seven, we added salmonella, log growth salmonella, um, a moderate challenge. Um, and uh, just added it to the milk replacer on, on the morning feeding. All calves were fed 500 grams of milk solids per day of a 2220, ad libitum access to a single 22% crude protein texturized calf starter, commercial calf starter, 22%. Uh, challenged with the log growth salmonella in the morning, and then we took body weights, took blood at 0, 7, 10, 14, 21, and then at 21 days of age, we harvested the animals and, and took some tissue samples and looked at some histomorphology of the intestines. Uh, looking at some data, this is haptoglobin, serum haptoglobin concentrations on the y-axis, age of the calf on the x-axis. Um, our control animals are in, are in this black. And so haptoglobin is what we call an acute phase protein. It's really low in a healthy animal that has no inflammation. And if there's some inflammation, you'll see haptoglobin go up. It's a positive acute phase protein, okay? So we use it as a marker of, of inflammation. And essentially what you see is at seven days of age before the challenge, because we took this blood sample the morning before the challenge, you can see the two control treatments. And again, these, these are actually no, not different at this time because they're both being fed the control milk replacer. And the control plus salmonella actually hadn't been challenged yet. So if you just take the average of these two, the probiotic supplemented calves have less inflammation even before the challenge, okay? Um, which calves early on, their int intestines is developing, there's the propensity that they're going to have more inflammation anyways. Um, so this is showing some benefit there. Is it causing maturation of the intestinal tract that there's less inflammation? Is there competition with, you know, some of the other enteric pathogens that they just have less inflammation? I'm not sure exactly. It's probably a combination of things. Um, but what's interesting is you look at the control that weren't challenged with salmonella, they, dr they start dropping, and they kind of reach their, their level where they had plateaued by day 20, you know, 14, 21. What's interesting with the control plus salmonella, we would expect inflammation to go up after we give salmon, our salmonella challenge. Rectal temperatures went up. Uh, we expected uh, some difference in, in this. And so we see an increase in, in haptoglobin in the control plus salmonella. Um, we also see an, a little increase in the probiotics. So it does go up a little bit, but again, remaining quite significantly lower than, than the, the control calves challenge with salmonella. Um, so again, this is just showing that we're reducing inflammation even just without a challenge and then also reduce the, the inflammation after a challenge. This is looking at the histomorphology of both the duodenum in black and the ileum sample. Um, I'm trying to think how many uh, millimeters were uh, uh, proximal to the ileal cecal junction. Um, I forget. Um, <clears throat> but so th this is ileal samples and, and these are duodenal samples. And this is looking just, this is, we have lots of measurements, but this is just one of them, the villi height to, to crip depth. Um, and so here's, let's just look at the control. I should have the control first. And let's look at the duodenum. So you have the, the duodenum, it's about 1.5 a ratio of the villi height to the crip depth. Okay, so generally we think higher is better. Okay, a, a bigger number of this ratio is better. And so you can see what happens when these control calves are challenged with salmonella. There's a decrease. And, and usually what this is is some type of villi blunting. 
Okay, so there was a decrease when we challenged these cows with salmonella, but look at the probiotic prevented that, that decrease. Um, same thing with, with uh, well, it's not the same thing, it's a little different. With the elium, um, our control, we see a numerically but not different uh, decrease in the, their uh, control plus salmonella, but we see that the, the probiotic supplemented animals that were challenged with salmonella actually have a, a greater bilide to, to height, uh, bilide to crypt uh, depth ratio. So again, essentially what we're looking at is feeding certain strains of lactic acid producing bacteria can increase fecal excretion of those bacteria, but more importantly, they can reduce measures of both systemic inflammation um, as well as intestinal inflammation, I think both before and during a disease challenge with salmonella. So again, th this is showing that potentially there's, there's a strategy that we can improve the health of, of not only the intestines, but uh, subsequently the, the systemic uh, inflammatory response. Um, so here's some a preliminary. I just included this actually uh, today. Uh, we just actually weaned these, uh, the second group of these calves on Monday. So this is almost, it was like a, almost a product comparison. We have a, a lot of treatments in the study. We have five different treatments in the study. One of the treatments was a beta-glucan from mushrooms, uh, about one gram per day. Um, we also fed low molecular weight molecules that were isolated from colostrum, so it's things taken from colostrum that's non-IgG. Um, and we only fed that for the first three days. Um, again, some of those, uh, primarily it's probably gonna be like IGF-1. Can we get that uh, intestines to mature a little faster? And then we had two treatments where we had different combinations of probiotics and, and or yeast cell wall fractions. And so this just shows block one, the body weight gain from zero to 56 days of age. These calves were, were fed 700 grams of uh, 2220 milk replacer powder and, and had ad limited access to a texturized calf starter, 20% crude protein texturized calf starter. So this is just showing the descriptive statistics of, and it's just showing the descriptive mean and, and median of the block one. So the, each of these is, consists of 10 animals per treatment. Um, so essentially what you can see in the first block, and let's just pick the median for the, for the time being, that colostrum uh, product really did not increase body weight gain. Um, there was a small increase in, in body weight gain in the, the beta-glucan treated. Um, our lactobacillus treatment had the, the greatest increase in, in body weight gain in that first block. And then our yeast cell wall plus a bacillus uh, probiotic had a, a, a numerically greater um, I haven't actually statistically you know, this, and that's why I'm just showing the descriptive nature of this. So again, maybe these three treatments improved in this first block. Okay, let's just let's say that. Here's block two, higher risk group of calves. This, these groups, this group of calf came in a day after the other ones got weaned, and um, it was just a higher risk, higher uh, failure passive transfer in these calves. And so you can see our control calves, again, let's just pick the median. Uh, so this was these calves that we just weaned on Monday. Um, 21.1 was the body weight gain, so really low body weight gain. I really try to get to, a, in a 56 day, I'd like to see at least 35 kilogram body weight gain, because that means by 60 days, I'll get close to the almost doubling body weight. So really low body weight gain, and the, these calves just didn't eat starter. It was just kind of interesting, the students like, yeah, they're not eating starter, and I said, yeah. It, they're, and we knew coming in, they were a higher risk group, and, and so it just kind of translated through. What's interesting though, is we end up seeing a, a numerically different, it seems like all four treatments actually numerically increased the, the body weight gain. And I mean, you're looking at, in this case, you know, a, a, a five kilogram difference. That's a pretty big difference in, in body weight gain um, in these calves. What's interesting is when we start, we, we always wean the calves and then we follow them for a month and we're pulling them off treatment. And so all these calves are group housed in, in smaller groups kind of mixed uh, amongst treatments. Um, and in the first block, we've, we've gotten the data back and actually we saw that these last two treatments in terms of looking at the median again, from a small data set that they actually continue to, to gain more body weight. So actually at 84, day, 84 days of age. So that's why I think there is some, and we're starting to see this in other data sets. I could show you probably two other data sets that's similar is that we seem to be continuing to improve the, the performance of these animals even after we've weaned them and pulled them off treatments. So I think there's something going on there um, where we're setting these calves up to, to even be uh, more efficient or, or uh, better performers. Um, What's interesting though is there is a difference between these two blocks. I like to point that out is in block one, really these three treatments probably, and in block two, all four treatments. So again, I, I said this yesterday in, in one of the breakout sessions, I said, if anybody ever comes to you and says, this will work 100% of the time, they're 100% wrong, okay? Nobody, it never works 100% of the time, okay? It, it may only, something may only work 60% of the time. If you look at the effects of prebiotics or probiotics or whatever in literature, it doesn't work all the time. I actually uh, I got brought in to review some data for an internal company once, 
And they sat me down and showed me like 20 some odd data sets. And they said, all right, what do you think of our data? And I said, where's your losses or where's the ones that show no differences? Oh, we don't have any of those. I said, well. I said, we design studies. I don't know how much you know about how we design studies. We design studies that if something really exists, there's really a difference, 80% of the time we'll find that difference. So 20% of the time in a study, even if there really is a difference, we won't see it. Okay, we didn't have the statistical power to see that. So I just said, by default, 20% of your studies should show at least no difference. So I said, that's bias. And we talked about bias in an earlier section today. So I mean, this just shows, I, I like doing studies where you have multiple blocks. The ones that drive you crazy when you do multiple blocks is when you have a treatment go this way in one block, and then you have a treatment go the other way in another block. Then it's hard to wrap your head around. It doesn't do anything. Um, so generally speaking, you know, not all studies uh, report improvements. Um, but a lot of these things are generally regarded as safe. I'm actually going to stop my presentation after this slide, even though I have like 20 more slides. But I've already given a lot of that information. Um, so take home is not all studies reported improvements. Okay, like I said, that, and that's a good thing. Okay, that's a good thing that you don't see it that it always works. Okay, it actually. I, I'll be honest with you. I've, I've done a lot of uh, research with companies. I appreciate working with companies that. Oh, okay, yeah, that's we we understand. You know, it's the companies where it's, they want you to really drive home. Because it, but it, they need, everybody needs to understand, it's okay. Things don't work all the time, and nor should they work all the time. Um, you know, generally they should be regarded as safe. Mechanistically speaking, these products could reduce the risk for enteric disease, okay? Some people do approach me with something, I'm like, hmm, I don't even know how this would scientifically or mechanistically even work, okay? I was like, first you gotta figure that out. Okay, if, if, I got, if I can at least sit there and go, okay, uh, I see how this may work, and then let's, let's try it and let's try it under a couple different scenarios. You know, the generalization is, is the possible effect size that you may be able to see is probably closer to this three to five kilograms. Um, we do every so often, if things go really well, we can see a difference up, in a big, uh, an effect size maybe of seven kilograms. But realistically, you know, we're probably looking at weaning weight differences of five to 10 pounds or you know, three to five kilos is typically what, what we would see. Um, I have had a, a data set where we did see a 20 pound difference, which was, you know, I think the moon's aligned and uh, blessed that study. So, you know, and then here's the other thing that, that I'm starting to pay more attention to and, and get more interested into. Um, we're starting to look at from a mechanistic standpoint of maybe what's going on here, but the benefits may continue to, to persist even past the immediate post wean period. So we've been doing, here's, this is what I love about science. You do a study and, and then somebody says, you know, like say we stopped feeding them their treatments at weaning and kept following them. Well, what do you think would happen if you kept feeding it? Yeah, we didn't do that, but you know, we wanted to look at whether or not there was a carryover effect, so we designed the study this time to answer that. You know, but we've done a lot of studies where we continue to feed it and we saw the difference kind of continue and then that's my brain goes, let's see if we stop it if we still see it. So we probably need to design the, the, the true factorial where you have pre-weaning and post-weaning, supplemented and non-supplemented, and see if, if the, the carryover um, is, is really there. Um, so, you know, I, I talked yesterday quite a bit on, on plane of nutrition and, and how much milk solids to feed. I'll uh, just summarize it in one sentence. I don't think there's a one size fits all. Like I said yesterday in my conclusion, I said I have guys that feed 600 grams of milk solids where I'm not gonna tell them to feed any more milk solids. But I also have guys that <coughs> are feeding 600 grams of milk solids. Um, and I tell them, eh, we might wanna look at feeding a higher level of milk solids. You know, if, if this was what we were seeing all the time, we were feeding these guys 700 grams of milk solids. And if I'm only getting this type of gain and this is consistent, we're having issues where we need to try to figure out how can we feed these calves a little bit more milk solids because these calves just were not going on starter. And it's a good starter too. Um, it's the exact same starter that the, the previous group was on and, and, and we're doing pretty good. But these are high risk calves again. So um, you know, some of the benefits that we're seeing of feeding higher levels of milk solids is not in improving gastrointestinal disease per se if you have a pretty healthy group of calves, feeding more milk solids may improve gastrointestinal disease. If you have a really crappy group of calves, feeding more milk solids may actually compound the problem, I think. Um, some of the benefits we're getting in feeding more milk solids may actually be post-weaning and reducing respiratory disease as well. Um, so 
that, that's just kind of a, a quick little tidbit on that if you missed my talk yesterday. I'm out of time.